<coughs> Hello, everybody. We apologize for a little bit delay. Good afternoon and a warm welcome to all for today's online lecture session. I am Srinu Apikonda, curator at Birla Industrial and Technological Museum. We thank all of you for joining us today. Antimicrobial resistance is a global health and development threat. World Health Organization has declared that antimicrobial resistance is one of the top 10 global public health threats facing humankind. We are happy to have a lecture. Uh, we are happy to have a lecture today on the same topic, antimicrobial resistance and superbugs on World AIDS Day. We are delighted to have Dr. Sanjay Bhattacharya here with us today as a guest speaker for this sessions. During the sessions, viewers may post topic related questions for the speaker in the comment section. A few of them will be answered toward the end of the sessions. We have with us our director, Sri V.S. Ramchandran. With this note, may I now request our director, Sri V.S. Ramchandran, to introduce Dr. Sanjay Bhattacharya, the speaker for this afternoon. Sir, please. Hello, viewers. All of you are aware that today is uh, World AIDS Day, December 1. Uh, we have got a very apt topic and a very prominent speaker on this occasion. The topic is antimicrobial resistance and superbugs. And Dr. Sanjay Bhattacharya is available with us. I would like to very, give a brief introduction and then there is a platform for Dr. Bhattacharya. Uh, today, uh, we shall learn from Dr. Bhattacharya the problems of antimicrobial resistance and superbugs. Dr. Sanjay Bhattacharya is the chairperson of Hospital Infection Control Committee, Tata Medical Center, Kolkata. He obtained MBBS from North Bengal Medical College, West Bengal MD in Microbiology from Jipmer, Pondicherry. He obtained DNB from the National Board of Examinations, New Delhi. He also obtained DIP or CP, RCPAT in Medical Microbiology and the first part in virology from the Royal College of Pathologists, London, UK. In addition to this, he was involved in various WHO projects, World Health Organization, like Working Group for Priority Pathogen List, Working Group on Environmental Cleaning in Carbon Resistant Organisms, Working Group Landscape of Diagnostic Against Antibacterial Resistance in LMIC. He was also involved in ICMR, Working Groups on bacteriology. Uh, such an eminent speaker, he has got more than 100 articles under his name. So welcome you, sir, on behalf of Villa Industrial and Technology Museum, that platform is yours. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, sir, for the very kind introduction. And I would like to thank uh, uh, the Villa Industrial Technological Museum the director, sir, and the curator, sir, for giving us this uh, wonderful opportunity to speak to our audience about the problem of antimicrobial resistance and the superbugs. So uh, if I could have the first slide, please, uh, yes, Rino, sir, it would uh, help yes, me. Yes, so if you could I'm share I'm the I'm slides. I'm yes, I'm ready. Sir, could you see the slide? Is it visible? Yeah, sir? if you could make it full. Yes, yeah, I, it I, is I, visible, I, but once it is confirmed, then I'm making yes. 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 Yes, sir. Thank you. Can you. Okay, so I begin my presentation with the topic superbugs and uh, the global problem of antimicrobial resistance, also known as AMR. And I would like to thank the National Council of Science Museum and the BITM, the Birla Industrial and Technological Museum, Kolkata, which has been a very fond destination for me and my children for the last many, many years. And I'm very fortunate and honored to be part of this initiative from uh, BITM. Next slide, please. So as you know that uh, 
antibiotics are used for a wide variety of infections and uh, these antibiotics are actually life saving drugs now these drugs uh, these drugs uh, actually are very important for the health and well being of patients who are suffering from infections particularly bacterial infections now uh, what happens this slide shows you what is the burden of antimicrobial resistance infections in india and it is an example of how these infections are responsible for the death of many many people and in this case uh, it shows the burden of antimicrobial resistance in india neonates now neonates are children who are actually less than 1 month of age so less than 30 days of age so this slide shows that every year 1 million indian children die in the first 4 weeks of life so that is called the neonatal period that is the first 4 weeks of life 1 million or 10 lakh uh, indian children do die unfortunately of these about 2 lakhs so the about 20% of them are caused by sepsis so sepsis is a serious form of infection there are many causes of sepsis most common causes are bacterial sepsis and they kill about 2 lakh people or 1 lakh 90000 children uh who are neonates uh, uh every year now it has been seen in that about 60 percent or just over 30 some of the neonates 100 a day it's about 150 a day neonates die every year every year from antibiotic resistant infections so that's the the scale of the problem that we are facing it's not a problem restricted to india only it's a global problem countries do have variety of different types of infections and variety of rates of drug resistant infections and uh, this shows how these infections actually damage our society and our well being next slide please next slide please yeah so uh, first of all we need to know what are the common superbugs uh, okay and uh, but before that before that we would actually try to understand if you go on to the slide after that that what are superbugs now uh, mr srinu the next slide please because i think there is a sequence problem with the slides so if you could go to the next slide please what are superbugs we need to actually understand so superbugs are actually extensively drug resistant bacteria sometimes the term could be applied for extensively drug resistant fungus which fail to respond to common and broad spectrum antimicrobial agents which could be either antibiotics or antifungal agents so these are extremely drug resistant bacteria or they are extensively drug resistant fungus which fail to respond to common antibiotics or antifungal agents these bugs these are germs bacteria or fungus very small in size can spread from one person to another and they can cause serious life threatening infections mostly in hospitalized patients these can lead to high rate of morbidity and these morbidity can manifest as healthcare associated infection morbidity in simple term is sickness it can lead to high mortality or deaths it can lead to increased hospitalization or it can lead to increased healthcare expenditure so if we are to measure the impact of impact of the superbug infections we have to actually look at morbidity rate mortality rate hospitalization rate and healthcare exp expenditure rate so if we would now go on to the pre previous slide 
Uh, previous slide, please, sir. Yeah, so these are the common superbugs. Now, these names are very familiar to microbiologists, but I'm aware of the fact that majority of the people in the audience may not be microbiologists. So uh, you don't need to remember the names if you are not a microbiologist, but uh, these are the names if you're interested in scientific nomenclature, then these are the names actually you can consider uh, to remember. So the common superbugs, or which are extensively diarrhea, or they could be fungi. If they are bacteria, then they, they then there are a few types of them. Six of them are very common. These are methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, vancomycin-resistant Enterococcus, carbapenem-resistant E. coli or Escherichia coli. Carbapenem is the name of an antibiotic, a very broad spectrum antibiotic used for the treatment of serious uh, bacterial infections, carbapenem resistant Klebsiella pneumoniae, and carbapenem resistant Acinetobacter baumani, as well as carbapenem resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Now, among the fungi, you have Candida auris, which is a extensively drug resistant fungus, and which can also be classified as a superbug. There may be a few others, which I have not actually included in this list, but please be aware that these are the common ones of uh, common types of superbugs that are usually encountered in India as well as in other countries globally. The numbers may vary from country to country, but they are generally present in most countries of the world. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. So, what are the common antimicrobial agents taken as which superbugs? are resistant because we are talking about antimicrobial resistant infections it is worthwhile actually to know that there are uh, infections which are do not respond to antibiotics and we need to know what are these antibiotics to which the superbugs don't respond so these are many many of them are very very common antibiotics so for example there are antibiotics like penicillin, cephalosporin, astrionam. We are not effective against most of the superbugs that we have actually discussed. There are antibiotics like beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor. These are pharmacological names. These are chemical names. But it would make more sense to a microbiologist or a pharmacologist or a doctor. Uh, but it is also... Uh, important for anybody interested in science to be aware of their existence. Carbapenem, a group of antibiotics like meropenem, imipenem, doripenem, ertapenem. And there are other common antibiotics which are given. Antibiotics comprise about maybe 90% of the common antibiotics that are used in clinical practice, in medical practice. So the superbugs do not respond to most of them. And that makes them super. So they are not just bugs which cause infections, but they are bugs which do not respond to antibiotic treatment. So that's why they are superbugs. And antibiotic re or antifungal resistant superbugs, which are drug resistant fungi, like Candida auris, they don't respond to things like fluconazole, voriconazole, amphotericin B, which are name of some of the common antifungal agents that are used in clinical practice. So in, to sum up, they are very, very difficult organisms actually to treat in whatever setting it could be. Next slide, please. Now, we need to also know what are the common infections caused by superbugs. Now, so the superbug is not those pathogens which are causing only one type of infection. So this list shows you that a variety of different type of infections are possible due to superbugs. And these could be bloodstream infections, also known as bacteremia or fungemia, if it is caused by bacteria and fungus respectively, irritatory tract infections, healthcare-associated pneumonia, 
ventilator assisted pneumonia in patients who are ventilated for a variety of reasons because of respiratory failure surgical site infections medical device assisted infections like iv catheters urinary catheter in related infections skin and soft tissue infections as for example those due to bed sores or pressure sores or diabetic foot etc and sepsis and septic shock now septic and septic shock are very serious types of infection so any of the infections that are listed above they may lead to sepsis and sepsis is a clinical condition where there is not only infection but there is a dysregulation of the immune response to the infection so sepsis please remember is a very serious site or type of infection where there is not only infection infection must be there for sepsis but not just any infection it is an infection where there is a serious dysregulated immune response any infection will lead to an immune response but when that immune response lacks regulation lacks control it becomes sepsis and septic shock is a very severe type of sepsis which leads to high morbidity high mortality etc uh, etc et next slide please so we need to also know what are the type of patients in which superbug infections are commonly found now there are it's it's if we know the type of patients where superbug infections are found probably we could focus our resources to prevent infections to prevent superbug infections in those patients who are more vulnerable so the most important type is the patients on frequent and prolonged use of broad spectrum antibiotics so patients who are using antibiotics very often very frequently which are broad spectrum antibiotics they are very prone to superbug infection so we should be wary about using antibiotics hospitalized patients so these are the another group of patients who are very very vulnerable to superbug infections then there are patients with frequent admission or visits to hospitals now many patients either because of hemodialysis or because or because of uh, let's say uh, cancer treatment uh, those patients who have chronic uh, disorders chronic health issues be it heart disease respiratory diseases liver disease kidney disease neurological diseases bone joint disease so they may have to visit the hospital many many times and the more one visits the hospitals and more one gets antibiotic treatment the greater the propensity to get superbug infections uh, so uh, it is not been surprising for cancer patients who are under treatment for weeks months and sometimes years to have superbug infections there are also transplant patients like those with liver transplant kidney transplant uh, etc or bone marrow transplant also known as hematopoietic stem cell transplant to have superbug infections because they have to be very intensively associated with the healthcare setting they often have uh, immunosuppression as a result of which they have infection because of infection they have they are treated with antibiotics and these antibiotics in turn lead to the generation of superbugs uh, and because of the frequent visit to healthcare settings they also can get the superbug infections from an exogenous source so please remember that superbug infections in a patient can have two sources one is the endogenous source where the bacteria present inside our body they become resistant and they cause infections and it could also have an exogenous source where the bacteria which are present in the external environment and already which has become resistant and become a superbug is entering into the body from some route through some route and the patients with medical devices such as catheters iv lines urinary catheters they are also prone to develop superbug infections next slide please. so the golden question is that we have known all these sort of things all these dangers from superbug but what can we do about it so the one of the big objectives of this presentation is to make the audience aware 
what are the ways to prevent superbug infections so i have listed a few uh, points which may help viewers and learned audience and science uh, enthusiast from developing strategies to prevent superbug infections so number one is reduce use of broad spectrum antibiotics if you have reduced use of antibiotics in the hospital in in the community in the farm sector there is a great possibility of reducing superbug infections maintain good hand hygiene so washing of the hands with soap and water and if that is not available at least a alcohol based hand sanitizer is very important to prevent patient to patient spread staff to patient spread of superbug infections safe and appropriate segregation disposal of management of biomedical waste you know that the waste that is generated in healthcare facilities like hospitals nursing homes dispensaries health centers etc they are by very nature different from the type of waste that we generate in the community in our houses in our homes because in the hospital you are using many many medical devices some of them are disposable some are ppe like personal protective equipments and the patients are also vulnerable to many infections including superbug infections so these wastes are actually contaminated with many bacteria many other pathogens many germs and many of them could be superbugs so handling that is a segregation disposal management of the biomedical waste in the healthcare facility is very very important also we must remember to use ppe appropriately now in the covid era we have been as we have come to know about these superbugs uh, about the ppe that is uh, things like uh, mask gloves cap plastic apron uh goggles face shield etc now these are examples of ppe now but please remember that the ppe is not just for covid okay ppe has been there for many many reasons for many many years and it is actually used in healthcare setting for a variety of reasons sometimes to protect the patient often to protect the staff and quite quite on a number of times to do both so we have to use the pp appropriately environmental cleaning and disinfection is very very important we are now going through the swachh bharat uh, campaign to clean india campaign uh, uh, it is an important initiative to actually clean up our communities our hospitals because unless we can maintain cleanliness has to be safe injection practices whenever giving any intramuscular injection intravenous injection subcutaneous injection either for vaccination or for other medicine delivery a saline infusion these have to be done under very very aseptic precautions safe disposal and treatment of date expired antibiotics or antibiotic waste from pharmaceutical factories you know but we cannot throw our antibiotics into the garbage okay we cannot recycle throw uh, medicines they have to be disposed up appropriately as biomedical waste okay uh, the effluents from antibiotic pharmaceutical industry cannot go go into the drain or go, cannot go into the river so they have to be properly processed and then they should be discarded as waste appropriate use of antibiotics in veterinary medicine for animal health this is another important measure which is important for the prevention of superbug infection slide please what can the general public do to reduce superbug infections in the community uh, now the general public interestingly can do a lot of things see the general is able to do anything without the help of the general public all the specialty knowledge all the scientific knowledge would go in vain if it cannot be adopted at the community level if it cannot be implemented at the community level so the general public has to be educated has to be informed about scientific principles about scientific practices 
about standard operating procedures. So the general public can do a lot. So what can the general public do to reduce supervised infections in the community? Do not take antibiotics without the prescription of a registered medical practitioner. That's very, very important. We often go to the medicine shop and tell that I'm having fever or I'm having a sore throat. Can you suggest some antibiotics? Now, that is a bad practice. Okay. Because you are not a specialist. The pharmacist is also not a doctor. Okay. He may be giving it in good faith, but by doing so, he is actually not following the standard practice. Do not take the antibiotics beyond the prescribed number of days. Doctor acts as antibiotic for five days. We decide to take it for seven days or 10 days. That's wrong. Do not use old prescriptions from a previous illness to buy or use antibiotics. Often happens, I had, let's say, an infection in January of 2020. I... I, I remember the signs and symptoms. I went to a doctor. The doctor gave me some antibiotics. I took the antibiotics and got better. Now, after that, what happened is that I have another infection in July, let's say, of the same year. And I think that the symptoms are very, very similar. And I should be using the same antibiotics. Now, I am not a doctor. Even if I am a doctor, I should not be treating myself. I should go to another doctor take his or her advice and then take the antibiotics if required, if prescribed, only according to the prescription. So do not use antibiotics for common com uncomplicated illnesses such as mild fever, mild uh, cold, mild cough or allergy or diarrhea. There is a propensity in the community. You have somebody has one or two episodes of diarrhea and they start taking antibiotics. Now, that is not right. The treatment of di diarrhea is not necessarily antibiotics. Most diarrhea can be treated with oral rehydration solution, which is much cheaper, much effective, safer than any antibiotics to treat diarrhea. Do the essential things to avoid infections. Lead a healthy lifestyle. Lead, have a healthy diet. Maintain hand hygiene. Maintain personal hygiene. Exercise regularly, control comorbidities like diabetes and obesity, reduce, control, and eliminate addiction like smoking and alcoholism, and take vaccines as recommended. If one is able to do all of these measures, they would be in a far better position actually to control infections and certainly drug resistant superbug infections. Next slide, please. So what can the pharmacist who is selling drugs can do to control the superbugs? Please remember, do not sell antibiotics or antifungal agents without a valid prescription. So the, what is a valid prescription? A valid prescription is one where it is prescribed by a registered medical practitioner. Okay, see the doctor's name, doctor's qualification, doctor's registration number. It should be dated appropriately. You should not be prescribing an antibiotic which is dated in January and you're dispensing that antibiotic or selling that antibiotic in November or December. Do not do that. Do not sell antibiotics for antifungals beyond the specific specified number of dates. So the doctor may have said, take the antibiotics for five days for which 10 tablets of antibiotics are enough. You go on selling 20 drugs. That's inappropriate. Okay, I can understand that you, you may not always like to sell medicines by cutting a strip. Do not do that. But do not make your best effort to sell what is essential. Store antibiotics in appropriate temperature and humidity conditions and transport them appropriately. Because unless you can safely store them, safely transport them, they would lose their efficacy. And I, so if they lose the efficacy and quality, then they would not be able to treat any infections. And that will lead to more drug-resistant infections. Next slide, please. So the superbug infections in HIV AIDS patients. Now, today is the World AIDS Day. And we know in India, there are many cases of HIV infections. The total number is about 2.1 million or about 21 lakhs. Now, uh, 
uh, it sounds uh, uh, sounds uh, staggering in terms of percentage it will probably come about 0.2 percent because we have a large population but don't underestimate never underestimate hiv if there is one lesson about hiv aids one has to take home on this world aids day is never underestimate hiv aids and you know it can be sexually transmitted hiv can be transmitted through unsafe use of intravenous drugs and intravenous needles and syringes it can be transmitted from mother to children it can be transmitted through blood and blood products so take the appropriate precautions to prevent hiv aids so that's the important message on the world aids day aids patients are more vulnerable to superdrug infections than hiv patients without aids please note that all patients with hiv uh, not all patients with hiv get aids so what there is a difference between getting hiv and getting aids aids is a situation where an hiv patient has lost significant amount of his or her immunity because of an unregulated or unrestricted proliferation of the hiv virus which has destroyed most of the immunological cells of the body when that condition develops where the body's immunity has destroyed by the hiv then one gets aids and when one gets aids they develop opportunistic infections or aids related malignancies or cancers in aids immunity towards infection or cancers is severely compromised its patients are more likely to be admitted to hospital and have aids related infections or malignancies as i just described and the progression from an hiv infection to aids can be delayed or stopped by taking by taking antiretroviral treatment regularly as per the advice of hiv physicians so that's the important message so if one takes antiretroviral medications appropriately one can prevent the progression from a hiv infection to that of aids so next slide please now this is a sort of a blown up uh, pie chart which shows the global impact of antimicrobial resistant or superbug infections now you have currently now this report is about 4 years old and it was estimated in 2016 that is 4 years back that currently 700000 people or 7 lakh people die of antimicrobial resistant infections i gave you the figure uh, almost from the same time that every year about 60000 neonates die of antibiotic resistant infections in india alone now this is a global figure 700000 people die of antimicrobial resistant infections but if we are unable to control it by 2015 so it estimated that in about 30 years time 10 million or 1 crore people may die from antibiotic resistant infections now that's a lot of deaths okay so it's a staggering amount of death and how serious it is if one just has a look at the other causes of death it would be clear compared to that cancer causes 8.2 million deaths cholera about 100000 deaths die about 1.5 million deaths uh, diabetes about uh, the same million deaths 1.5 measles about 1 lakh 30 thousand deaths road traffic accidents road traffic accidents about 1.2 million deaths and tetanus about 60 thousand deaths so antimicrobial resistance may overtake all these other causes of death if we are unable to control it by variety of different measures next slide please so this is an important report what also uh, which came out uh, from a committee which was chaired by uh, jim o'neil and uh, and i would recommend those of you who are interested in this topic to actually go through this report it is an 84 page document 
It is freely available on the World Wide Web. So if you just Google it with this, with the GM O'Neill report on AMR or antimicrobial resistance, you will get this. And it gives the variety of different reasons and measures that are that can be taken to prevent and protect us from drug resistant superbug infections. Next slide, please. Now, it has been observed that you cannot tackle antimicrobial resistant infections using a single tool or a, using a single approach. You should actually use a variety of different tools or approaches to tackle drug resistant infections. So the Jim O'Neill report talks about 10 different uh, fronts on which antimicrobial resistance or superbugs have to be fought. And this include public awareness and this meeting is aimed towards that. Antibiotics in agriculture and environment has to be reduced. Sanitation and hygiene have to be improved. Vaccines and alternative modes of treatment such as fast therapy, etc. have to be explored. Surveillance for antimicrobial resistance. That is, we should know on a, almost on a real-time basis what is the magnitude of problem of antimicrobial resistance. We should know how many bloodstream infections or sepsis are caused by antimicrobial resistance superbugs. We should know how many urinary tract infections are caused by them. We should know how many surgical site infections are caused by them. We should know how many pneumonia are caused by antimicrobial resistance superbugs. So that is surveillance. And we need to put in place a surveillance system. We need to invest in human capital because we have to create experts. We have to create lab technologists. We have to create uh, vaccine manufacturers for prevention of drug resistant superbug infections. There has to be a global innovation fund because it is not cheap to develop new antibiotics. And sometimes they are not very profitable businesses. So there has to be an innovation fund to do that. There has to be development of rapid diagnostics because these infections have to be actually detected early to prevent morbidity and mortality. We have to have new drugs to treat these superbug infections. And there has to be international coalition for action. See, because it is a global problem affecting about 200 countries. So all countries have to work together to fight this menace. It spreads from people to people, from country to country. And it does not even leave the environment. So there has to be a global coalition to fight antimicrobial resistance superbugs. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Sir, it's there. It's done. Next slide, please. Sir, it's done. Could you see, sir, that slide? I'm unable to see the next slide. Unable to see. Okay. Are you able to see, sir? No. Yes. I'm now able to see. Thank you. No. So uh, the, the other strategy is lowering demand for antimicrobials and reducing unnecessary use is very, very important. So if you lower the demand for antimicrobial agents or anti um, antibiotics, if you reduce unnecessary use of antibiotics, your battle is half won. But for that, it is easy said than done. For that, you need to increase public awareness. You need to actually improve sanitation and hygiene. You need to reduce antibiotic use in agriculture and environment. You need to develop vaccines for preventable diseases to prevent super infections by super bugs. You need to develop rapid diagnostics and you need to invest in human capital. All that has been said before, but I'm, I'm saying that once again to highlight its importance. Next slide, please. Another very simple uh, but very important method is provision of safe, portable drinking water and washing water to people. So if we have better water and sanitation facilities, it reduces antibiotic microbial consumption. So it has been shown in a study in four middle-income countries 
that introducing water and sanitation infrastructure could sustainably reduce the number of uh, related diarrhea related treated with antibiotics. So if you use better water quality, if you have better sanitation facility, it reduces the incidence of diarrheal diseases. And it also reduces the need for antibiotics. So it was found that 60% potential decrease in the number of cases of water and sanitation related diarrhea being treated with antibiotics. So if you do these things, improve sanitation and provide better water, 60% decrease in diarrheal diseases and diseases which need to be treated with antibiotics. Next slide, please. Now, antibiotics are also used in farm animals like cattle, cows, buffalo, sheep, etc. Sometimes they are used to treat infections in these animals. Sometimes they are also used to increase productivity uh, as growth promoters. So uh, the scientific evidence is such that, that most published papers provide evidence to support limiting use of antibiotics in agriculture. Okay, so here, 114 studies supported limiting the use of antibiotics and 100 academic papers support limiting use and 15 against limiting use. So the evidence in favor of limiting antibiotics in agriculture is really overwhelming. There is practically no comparison. There is practically no doubt at the moment as the scientific evidence stands that if we reduce the use of antibiotics in agriculture, it helps in, in actually reducing superbugs in the community. Next slide, please. Increasing coverage of vaccines can reduce antibiotic use. Now, there are many vaccines. And unfortunately, although we have a very elaborate and in some places very robust childhood immunization services, is it is not the case with adults. And also, there are many other infections which could be preventable with vaccines, as we are seeing with COVID vaccine, which is making so much of the use. So there are many, many uh, infections like uh, pneumonia uh, is a common bacterial infection for which there are very good vaccines currently available. There is influenza vaccine, for example. But majority of the population do not use these vaccines because either they are not in the national immunization program yet or they are out of reach of the common people or the public awareness has not been developed yet. There is lack of funding. All these reasons are there where vaccines are being suboptimally used. So if we use the vaccines properly, uh, it has been shown there could be a 47% reduction of antibiotic use. So that's a remarkable figure that appropriate use of vaccination can reduce antibiotic use. Next slide, please. So there is no doubt that, that better diagnostic technology, that is better laboratory tests and better treatment could save numerous lives. So this was seen in case of TB. So if you have TB, which has a better diagnostics, it has one type of curve in terms of saving lives. If you have TB where you have used better treatment modalities, you're saving life situation improves. And last but not least, if you do both, that is smarter diagnostics and better treatment, better treatment in terms of better observation, better supervision, better quality control of the drugs, uh, and better diagnostics, you can save many more lives. And for TV, it was found that lives, about 7 lakh 70,000 lives could be saved over the next 10 years by combining better diagnostics with better treatment. And that is true, not just for TB. It is true for superbug infections as well. Next slide, please. 
Next slide, please. Yeah. So, if so, uh, to summarize, superbug infections is a global emergency. There is no doubt about that. Various learned authors, various scientific bodies, various organizations have warned that superbug infections is a global emergency, just like COVID, albeit in a much more slow pace than COVID. But it is actually picking up. And if not tackled, rising AMR or antimicrobial resistance could have a devastating impact. It has been estimated that if we are unable to stop the spread of superbugs by the year 2050, so that's only 30 years time, the death toll could be a staggering one person dying every three seconds because of AMR or antimicrobial resistant infections. So the problem could be such that every three seconds, somebody somewhere in this globe, in this planet Earth, is dying because of drug-resistant infections unless it is tackled like an emergency, as we are doing in case of COVID. Now, these are all challenges. And one of the challenges is actually funding for the development of new tools, new techniques, new drugs, new public awareness campaigns for the prevention and treatment of superbug infections. Next slide, please. So this slide shows that what sort of investment is required. So estimated cost to be funded globally at a supranational level for 10 years to control superbug infections. So this cannot be achieved with a substantial investment in healthcare, in preventative health. So promote the development of new antimicrobials, including make, making better use of the existing ones. So that will cost over 10 years about 16 billion US dollars. So promote development. Global Innovation Fund supporting basic and non-commercial research in drugs, vaccines, and diagnostics. This will take another $2 billion. So to support the companies to develop these drugs, you need money because it may not be profit-making initially or directly. So that Global Innovation Fund would have to be funded by about $2 billion over the next five years. Rolling out existing and new diagnostics and vaccines. So there are certain tools like vaccines and diagnostic tests, laboratory tests, which are already there, but they are not accessible to majority of the general public. In order to make them accessible, you need another one to two billion dollars per year for the next few years. And the global public awareness campaign. So public have to be informed, educated, new training has to be given to aspiring specialists. In order to do that, you need about 100 million US dollars per year. So it looks like a lot of money, but in the grand scheme of things, when our existence is at stake, it is like a war effort. So as you spend money in the protection of the country, you have to spend money to prevent superbug infection. So that is the nature of the challenge facing us. Next slide, please. I would conclude by drawing your attention to these important references. The first web link is for the Jim O'Neill report. The next is from the ICMR's website about antimicrobial resistance surveillance network. The third is from the World Health Organization, followed by the one from Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And I must also thank the Science Museum to put up important and interesting messages for the general public about superbugs, about drug resistant infections, and organizing lectures and demonstration sessions like the one that we are having now. And uh, I would like to conclude my talk by acknowledging and uh, saying thank you 
to the National Council of Science Museum, the Birla Industrial and Technological Museum in Kolkata, Indian Council of Science, uh, Indian Council of Medical Research, and the Tata Medical Center in Kolkata, who has given us the platform to have this session today. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions from the audience if there are any. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. It's been a very informative, enriching talk, and you have uh, presented such a lucid manner to address the major issues of the antimicrobial resistance. Hope our viewers must have definitely understood. So um, uh, I'll be taking attending few of the questions from the visitors. May I attend, sir? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Srinu, sir, if you could speak a bit loudly because I, the audio yeah, is of low volume. Okay, sir, I would be speaking loudly. So can okay. you hear me? Sir? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can just about hear you. Yeah, yeah yes, sir, yes, sir. So I would be attending questions posted by the viewers. So uh, first question is from Riddhi. And uh, she wants to know who is most at risk for the for antibiotic resistance. Okay, so the question, if I've understood correctly, uh, Mr. Srinu, I hope uh, I am audible to you yes, and the audience. You, you are very much audible, sir. Okay, so as I have given you in a list in the slides, that the people who are most at risk are those who take antibiotics frequently, particularly uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, those who visit hospitals and healthcare centers for a variety of reasons repeatedly, uh, those who are immunosuppressed like HIV, cancer patients, transplant patients, those who have medical devices like vascular catheters or intravenous lines or urinary catheters. So these are the people who are more prone to develop superbug infections. Of course, personal hygiene play a very important role. So if somebody is not maintaining a very hygienic practice, they are more prone to develop these superbug infections. Thank you, sir. Achisman would like to know, can bacteria and virus develop resistance to vaccines? Uh, yeah, there is a phenomenon called vaccine non-response, but that is not exactly resistance. See, uh, uh, there are, you will see that antibiotic resistance is not the same as vaccine non-response. So the public and the listeners should be very clear about that, that it is not that all vaccines will work. But vaccine non response is an immunological phenomenon. Okay, it has not much to do with okay. drugs. Whereas antibiotic resistance occurs or superbugs infection occurs because of exposure to antibiotics, antifungals, and other drugs. So the mechanism of vaccine non response and antibiotic resistance is totally different and they should not be mixed up and confused. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Ne next one from Gargi. Is antibiotic resistance gene vary with the bacteria or they remain same in different bacteria? Yes, certainly. Antibiotic, actually there is a genetic basis of antibiotic resistance. Um, I have not gone, gone into the details of the genetic basis of antibiotic resistance because uh, we wanted to make the topic and the presentation lucid and very clear for the general audience. Uh, but there are antibiotic resistance genes and these antibiotic resistance genes are ultimately responsible for antibiotic resistance. So what happens when a bacteria is actually exposed to antibiotic? It may respond and get killed or inactivated 
or it may develop a resistance. Now, when this resistance develops, generally a change in this genetic makeup also occurs. And these are known as antibiotic resistance genes. Now, these genes can transfer from one bacteria to another bacteria. And these genes can transfer from the mother bacteria to the daughter bacteria or the father bacteria to the, uh, to the next generation of bacteria. Or, so or they can transfer between two bacteria coexisting at the same time. So uh, there could be a horizontal spread of the antibiotic resistance gene uh, or there could be a vertical spread of antibiotic resistance genes. Uh, so this is uh, very much a reality and a topic of ongoing research. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, next one is from Pratya Sarpal. Can antibi antibiofilm be used to mitigate the widespread problem imposed by NMR strains? I did not get the question very clearly. If you could repeat it. Can antibiofilm be used to mitigate the widespread problem imposed by NMR strains? Uh, the question is still not very clear, but what I have understood that whether is sort of an antibiotic coated film could be used to prevent uh, certain types of infections. Now, there are devices in the market which are antibiotic impregnated. As for example, antibiotic coated catheters are there antibiotic coated uh, urinary catheters, vascular catheters, uh, antibiotic coated other medical devices do exist. Now, the problem is that they may be useful for drug sensitive infections, but obviously they are not use, much useful for drug resistant infections. So that's the problem. Okay, sir. So next one is from Andropalli. Some diseases are spreading before proper diagnosis. How can we control the deadly diseases in rural areas like India? Yes. So that is why it is very true that it is not possible to get advanced technology at a very peripheral level, at a village level. So at that situation, there are certain things we have to do differently. As for example, sanitation, hygiene, safe portable drinking water, vaccination, awareness about the misuse of antibiotics. So these are the sort of educational interventions and lifestyle interventions and social interventions we have to introduce to tackle the problem of antibiotic resistance at the village level. Thank you, sir. So we have done with the question, sir. Now, uh, I have a question for you, sir. Would like to know. Sir, this is ongoing COVID pandemic time. And uh, uh, whoever gets infected with the COVID or, you know, uh, he or she will have to stay in the hospital. Or, you know, relative, relatives of that patient will have to visit to the hospital. That means whenever people visit to the hospital, there is a chance of hospital acquired infection, as you have mentioned, the external environment. Like. So in order to avoid this external environment, you know, contraction, so people, uh, you know, what kind of general precautions they can take? Uh, could you advise, could you suggest us? Sir? Okay, thank you, Sridhar, sir, for your question. It is true that COVID patients can also get bacterial infections and COVID patients certainly can get drug resistant superbug infections. Now the preventative techniques are no different, be it for COVID patients or be it for non-COVID patients. So the same principle of antimicrobial stewardship, which is safe, appropriate use of antibiotics in all sectors of healthcare is true. Safe, same principles of standard precautions, that is hand hygiene, appropriate use of PPE, appropriate use of bio, uh, disposal of biomedical waste 
environmental cleaning and disinfection, safe injection practices, respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette. These are the pillars based on which antimicrobial resistance has to be tackled. Personal hygiene and environmental hygiene are very big factors in prevention of superbug infections. So in COVID patients also, we should use antibiotics very judiciously. Be aware that COVID patients can get bacterial infections also. So do appropriate tests if there is a suspicion like culture, antibiotic sensitivity, etc., wherever it is indicated and prescribed by the doctor. Follow the doctor's prescription with regard to antibiotics and maintain a hygienic, healthy habit and practices, be it in the home, in the community, or in the healthcare settings. Thank you, sir. Sir, another one. Like, there is a notion that uh, human body becomes to resistant to antibiotics but the fact is that it is bacteria which become resistant to the antibiotics like in any case once antibiotic resistance is seen then can it be reversed well it's a important and interesting question whether antibiotic resistance can be reversed now it has been seen that if you do not use certain antibiotics for a significant period of time, the drug resistant bacteria becomes less common and over time the drug sensitive bacterial population increases. So because the antibiotics, they exert what is called a selection pressure on the microbial environment. Now, if you take out that selection pressure, what happens? The drug sensitive bacteria, and many of which are not harmful bacteria, they are helpful bacteria, they will have time to grow back and they will become, uh, they will overtake the population of the drug resistant bacteria. So, in that sense, uh, it is possible to see a situation where when you stop the use of a particular antibiotics, after a few years, you may see that the patients that are coming to the hospital are sensitive to a particular antibiotic which you have stopped using. So this is a phenomenon which is well recognized in medical practice. Thank you, doctor. Uh, sir, I'm done. One more question is there from the participant. If you allow me, I will take. Shall I take, sir? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes. Another question is from the same, the Pratyasa. She would like to know, can hypothetical pro, uh, proteins be used as a potential vehicles for developing drugs against superbugs? Yes, there are uh, research which is underway to identify proteins produced by not only uh, uh, these are either natural proteins such as enzymes or they are derived from bacteriophages, which are viruses, or from other living cells, that uh, they have a uh, action, they have an action against certain bacteria. Uh, so it is a matter of intense scientific research at the moment, whether you can use proteins from a variety of different sources to act as drugs to treat drug risk in infections, including superbug infections. Thank you, doctor. Uh, so questions are done, doctor. Bhattacharya. So we we have come to the conclusion uh, session. Uh, <clears throat> we, we thank you very much, Dr. Bhattacharya, for taking a time out from your very busy schedule and joining us today to address the AMR related issue. We are, we express our sincere gratitude to you and we look forward to have you with us in the, in, in future events uh, as well uh, in similar kind of uh, programs. And we thank you very much for joining us. Dis, uh, despite you are very busy just before the session begin, but still uh, somehow managed to join. We, uh, we are very much thankful uh, to you, Dr. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful opportunity. And I am uh, grateful to this platform given to spread 
public awareness about antimicrobial resistance and superbugs. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We thank you all the uh, viewers for joining us this afternoon. Um, and uh, not only joining and throughout active participation, uh, we are coming up with one more lecture uh, next week on 10th uh, on the topic Nobel Prize in Chemistry for 2020. We invite you all to join in that le lecture session as well. So uh, uh, this uh, in this lecture session as well. Do uh, uh, till the time and take care. Bye.